We got another good one for y'all today. Y'all know what it is, who it is. It's your man Maurice, a.k.a. The People's Source, as I always say as I bring myself in to my right. Frankie Fabre, back at it again, and uh, I think we got a good one for you guys today. We got a fucking great one for y'all today. Um, I am absolutely ecstatic, and uh, it's very personal for me due to the fact that I met my man when I was, I want to say, maybe 12 years old. And uh, we, we grew up in the same neighborhood. And, I mean, when you when you have a rapport with a person and you're able to grow as you continue to get older, and then I end up working with him as an adult, there's so many things that him and I have experienced just growing up in the same neighborhood and then getting into the same career field. And here we are today able to share stories and share moments with one another that we're going to get extremely vulnerable about and we're really here to open people's eyes about the 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 level of I guess disconnect that well disconnect and the connection that we were able to make with people and the job that we decided to take on so with that being said I want to introduce to you guys my friend my brother my family my man Steven Dominguez feel me yo I'm happy <laughs> as hell that you're here my brother and, and, and don't forget an author too yes yes published author for sure published I mean, author let's talk about that actually um we have Author Steven Dominguez. Yes, you feel me? Across the Bridge, a Rikers Island story. We got the, the Rikers Island, the C73 shirts on. My shit a little snug. Man, I, where's mine at, man? You know what I'm uh, we, say less. Say less. <laughs> my, we, shit, we look, yo, my shit a little snug. I asked him for an extra large. He gave me a large, but it's all good. <laughs> like I'm going to make it look like I got muscles today. You told me you was working out. I didn't, know you, I didn't think you were serious. Know, you feel me? Yeah, he, he wasn't. That's cap. <laughs> yeah, I fucked up, but it's all good. <laughs> Yeah, man, I appreciate you, man. Uh, Across the Bridge out right now on all platforms. Um, Basically, the Rikers Island story is... Real quickly, bring the mic in a little bit for you. Um, The book is based on the infamous jail, Rikers Island, which is located in New York City. A worldwide known jail um, for many reasons. Uh, I myself was a New York City correction officer there for four and a half years uh, from the tender age of 21 I became a New York City correction officer so I was a young man telling grown men what to do Mm -hmm. that was uh very different for me coming where I came from because the grown men were kind of telling us what to do you know right um I went to John Jay College of Criminal Justice I did not graduate because I wanted to start this job and the race to start this job was not because I woke up and I said I can't wait to be a correction officer the race was because I knew that it came with a uh, financial backing that for the next 20 years, I could be fairly good. Mm-hmm. And I come from a background. My mother's a New York City uh, substitute teacher for basically my entire life. So seeing what um, having a city agency job can do as far as benefits, as far as vacation, as far as time off, um, it's a plus. It's kind of like a, a lottery in a way, you know? And it's like, as an inner city kid, you kind of put in your bid for sanitation, fire department, police department, and corrections, in my case. Uh-huh. Um, I wanted the money. I wanted that stability. Uh, prior to, I worked for the Department of Homeland Security. I was a TSO, a TSA agent, for those who don't know. I forgot you did that, actually. I did that for... From the tender age of 18 to 21. Yeah. So, from the moment of adulthood, I've been in, I would say, type of a structural law enforcement starting background. Right. Right? I've basically been telling people what to do for a very long time a from a minor, you know? Um, after that, uh, I got into some stuff. We'll get into that. Um, I became a product of my environment. Sometimes I don't like saying that. Sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, We all make mistakes, and we're here to talk about that. But I became a New York City inmate after becoming a New York City correction officer. And this book makes me a character in this world that Rikers Island is that I want to basically share for entertainment purposes because the stories that come out of this place are mind-boggling sometimes. The violence, the sex, the drugs, the corruption, uh, the gang culture, just how uh, 
violence and uh, street justice on the outside is also dealt with on the inside. So I kind of intertwined all those stories. I made fictitious characters and I put them in this book. Mm. So, so I, I didn't get a chance to actually read the book. Um, definitely gonna do that. So it, it's a it's a fiction based on real life experience. Pretty much. Okay, um, dope. Pretty dope. much. All the way down to the characters. I've I molded certain characters that I can use and use certain characteristics from them, but also, you know, build uh, storylines, build uh, have character development, make it seem a little more risque than right. usual. Right. You know. So. Let's kind of let's kind of start from the beginning. It's, it's crazy. I remember you and I. We'll see each other at the barber shop, and yeah. I'll see you with your pants on. You know what I'm saying? I know you came from work, mm -hmm. and I remember going through the process of saying, "Yo, damn, I need like I, I need that. Like I, I I'm I'm making eight and a quarter right now." Mm -hmm. And I saw you every time I saw you. You know, you had a smile on your face. Yeah. You feel me? I would talk to you about the experience. Like, yo, Steve, how long you been on the island? You like, uh, you'll tell me how long. And I'm asking you how yeah. how things are going. It was exciting. I'm not gonna lie to you. It was exciting because it was different. Right? You know, like uh, the, the being desensitized and all that came a little bit after when you start realizing how deep these issues go. Because right. it's not just the inmates giving you heat; it's staff as well. 100. percent And when you say that, I remember telling you, like, look, I think I want to get on. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go ahead and, you know, bust that move and, 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 and become a CO. And you're like, bro, you're going to love it. Mm -hmm. You're going to love it. You're going to appreciate the experience. Like, I can't wait till you get on. And more, sure enough. So because on a personal level, I knew how you were structured. I knew how you were built. Mm -hmm. So I knew that you wouldn't fold under certain circumstances. And I know you could hold your own. Right. So that's why I said it'll, it'll be suitable. I wasn't going to tell you it was going to be glamorous, but right. it will, it'll be suitable for now, you know, especially given our age. Right. At the time that we had that conversation, I was maybe 22 years old, 23. I, I was 21. Yeah. Because yeah. I didn't get on when I took the, when I finally took the test, I didn't get on until I was 24. Yeah. We're kids at that time. People don't know that in clubs in New York City, you can't even get in sometimes if you're not over 25 as that's a, a male. That's a fact. So we're kids. So it's like, this is a, this is a great opportunity. Yeah. Well, who else is calling us to work right now? To make two thousand dollars a week, nobody. Mm -hmm, you gotta mm -hmm. take advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's and that's all, that's literally how I was looking at it. Like, yo, I need the money. I heard all the, all them damn stories about COs pulling all this money, driving these foreign cars, and like you said, a, a young boy growing up in New York. I'm like, yo, I need that. That's how I got uh, lured in because I'm coming out of class one day at John Jay, and they would have certain departments come and kind of like you know basically promote their department so these kids could take these tests. Right. People, uh, departments came from Las Vegas PD, uh, Seattle PD, uh, uh, Arizona Corrections, and then DOC in New York came, and I'm not thinking much of it. Stops me in my tracks. I've said this story so many times. Big man, what's up? How you doing? You know, I'm all right, chilling. How long you been here? How old are you? Oh, I'm 19. Oh, you're a little young, this and that, but you can take the test. And if you're a student here, it's free. Mm -hmm. So I'm like... All right, I'll take a free test. Fuck it. Why not? Aced it. Let me backtrack a little bit. He shows me his pay stuff. <laughs> like $4,200 bi-weekly. I don't know that he has 25 years on the job. Right. I don't know that he's doing crazy overtime. The only reason he's here at John Jay is because he had a use of force, and he's still working, but he can't have no inmate contact. Right. $4,200? Bi-weekly? I gotta be a thing, because that's exactly what someone did to me, too. Uh, Showed me they pay stuff. Where, where do I sign? Show me, because I, I want that. I want $4,200. That's nice. Right. That's, I'm coming from the airport. I don't come from nothing. I'm coming from the airport working part-time as a TSO. So, I'm only pulling in maybe 600 bi bi-weekly, mm -hmm. on top of going to school full-time. Four bands? So, now, you, <laughs> you, you, you get through this process, you get through the academy... You you, you 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 get assigned to GMDC, which is C seventy three on Rikers Island. Tell me about the process in the beginning. Like, what was your overall thought process? Now being brand new, being that new rookie coming on to now working in jail every single day. How was you feeling? What was that process like in adapting? It was definitely different from the environment that I came from. Remember, I'm coming from seeing people that are going on vacation. Mm -hmm people that are celebrating a wedding, people that are going to Vegas to chill with their buddies, uh, girls' trips, uh, bridal showers. People are happy. 
even though they might be panicking going through TSA because they don't know they took the laptop out, got to take the sneakers off. But after that, for the most part, that energy that I was enduring on the eight hours to 16 hour day was pretty positive. Right. Going to Rikers, everybody's frustrated, everybody's mad, everybody's annoyed. And it was a place where nobody wanted to be, not even the people that were getting paid to be there. Right. So the energy in there was like, and then the cramp, the you know, the cramping of 31 inmates and having 12 chairs in a day room with seven channels and only three uh, phones and two of them are operable. What does that create? That creates tension. Chaos. And imagine when it's 97 degrees outside on Rikers Island, there's no air conditioning. And the AC don't work. So it's 115 degrees, and I have a stat proof vest, and my uh, badge is extremely shiny, and I look brand new. It might not be a good day. I got to make it a good day. Right. So that was a huge transition for a young kid like me when it came to it being 11 p.m., and LeBron is playing, and the game is in overtime, and I got to tell these dudes to lock in. Go lock in. Nah, CO, I'm sticking it up. Excuse my language. SMD, I'm not going nowhere. You're dealing with people that, again, they're going to give you backlash because you're holding them. You took away their freedom. Maybe you didn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe the department did it, but whatever got them here. You represent that. I am a part of that. Right. So now... How did you find your your lane, your avenue on just figuring out how to relate to make sure now, like you said, I, everything you just said, 100%, having to figure out how to make it a good day. And that's not easy in jail, especially when the tension is so high and everyone is upset. How did you find your lane and your avenue and your comfort zone to say, this is how I'm dealing with these dudes while I'm here to make sure that I have a good day? I realized that the key to it all was just being relatable mm -hmm. because let's be honest, I'm around my peers. These guys are also 21, 22, 23. They're also black. They're also brown. So they're also from Queens. They're also from Harlem. So if we could have just general conversation, if I was your boy, but I know where to draw that line because I am a correction officer, there, there's a little more respect. And then when it comes to respect, which is one of the main things that everyone needs to have in jail. Um, your day goes a little smoother because they know who you are now. Right. They know what you stand up for. They know deep down that you probably just took a test and passed it, and that's the only difference between you and him. For sure. He didn't take the test. For sure. they know I don't have to have a bachelor's. They know I don't have to uh, go through an extensive training. It's 39 credits. Get a 75 or better or 65 or better. Pass the academy, which is a joke. 30 sit-ups, 50 crunches, 100 pull-ups, whatever they ask. And then... Hardest part about the academy was getting sprayed with that damn OC, that uh, mace. Hardest part about the academy for me was driving. Driving to there. And that's it. <laughs> like, that was a joke, you know? But they know, they know that you're just another kid from one of these close neighborhoods and you just took a test so yeah. when it gets to that word spreads so now nah, dominguez is cool man like let them rock i've had inmates that have gone crazy because they don't know me and then another inmate puts them in their place like you bugging cool. out yeah it's cool bro you wildin', you know so so talking about drawing the line right yeah obviously now you you've gained a certain level a certain status inside Dealing with the inmates, dealing with staff, name busting through the, you know what I mean, busting through the jail, you're doing good. At what point do you feel like you started making decisions pertaining to how it can benefit you and how it can also benefit the inmate? And how did you ultimately get to that point where you felt like, I'm going to do this? Was it a did was it a need? Or was it a want? And then once you made that decision, ultimately, how did you process all that information? And how was it even brought to your attention? Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna um, interject with how that even brewed mm -hmm. and came to fruition. Um, in these housing areas, not all, 
But for some reason, some of them had operating DVD players. So if you brought in a movie, if you brought in a music video compilation, if you brought in a, a, a rap DVD, a smack DVD, a battle rap DVD, whatever, that took away a lot of the, I don't know what to do today in the housing area and people are going to watch what's on TV because they're tired of the same four channels that were provided, that they're provided. And it takes away, like, it, it, it brings them back to being at home a little bit. Right. And it started becoming a thing where I started working the same housing area. So, you know, in a respectful manner, of course, they would be like, yo, you uh, can you try to get this movie? Because they know that I was getting these movies from the barbershop when I would cut my hair. I wasn't going out of my way to buy these movies or get it for these inmates just for that. It was just like something I did. And I was just buying stuff for me and bringing it to the island and putting the DVD in. And these inmates were like this. And I was weird to staff, but I wasn't the only one bringing in DVDs because obviously there's a DVD player. Yeah. But it was like locker room talk for you not to do that because technically that's still contraband. Yeah, technically. You know, and they can even go as far as to, I had an officer tell me, um, oh, they can break the the, the DVD in half and cut people. Shave I said, they got better, better weapons than that. Mm-hmm. That's nothing, you know, like, but... It started off that way, and then I feel like that kind of gave it an introduction to, like, wow, this is really making my day fly by. Mm-hmm. This is really giving me control because now they look at it like they owe me. Mm-hmm. So after bringing DVDs that they requested for, especially in the housing areas that I'm working constantly in, uh, high-classification housing areas at that, these dudes are facing real serious time, 20, 30, 60, 75 years. This isn't a low class where somebody stole a book bag. These are homicides these are multiple uh 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 attempted murders they're char- they're facing so these are the tough guys you know uh my my captain will come in and ask hey listen i need the guys to clean this and that and they're on it i don't even have to ask because there, there's a certain amount of respect that it's like yo dominguez looks out with the dvds man let's at least clean the crib so he can continue bringing in dvds and i think that kind of opened the door mm-hmm and then I'm starting to notice on these searches that there's a lot of drugs in this building. Mm-hmm. I'm walking into these housing areas and it smells crazy. It That's smells a, like a music studio. That is a fact. Well, you see the smoke. So obviously it's coming in. Mm-hmm. Visitor, civilian, or staff. It's getting right? in. It's getting in. And I'm starting to realize that those pieces of contraband, anything that is not accessible in jail, the market is crazy. Mm-hmm. Right. I get an inmate <clears throat> that I know from the street. Like, just like I know you from the street. When I say from the street, I mean I know the neighborhood, you, mean. Mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I used to mess with one of his uh, younger cousins, and I noticed him in the building literally my entire career. From the moment I got there, he's been fighting his case, fighting his case. After a couple of years, he sees that I'm a stand-up dude. I'm pretty solid. This inmate runs shit to a certain extent on his side of the building. He has all the sneakers that nobody can get. He has a, a nice watch. Like, his commissary's full. He has uh, strippers, mm-hmm. bottle service girls coming to visit him. He's the man in mm-hmm. there. The female CO staff fucks with him, you know? So, I already knew that he was the man on the outside, too. Mm-hmm. So, this was nothing new. And every once in a while, when he would catch me by himself, yo, I think you should, you know? And I would act dumb. I'm like, yo, Nah, that's... I already knew what he was talking that's about. That's a fact. He's not the first inmate to ask me they, to bring something yeah, yeah. in. They, go, they definitely go oppose it to you. My paperwork... We'll backtrack. My paperwork has said that um, the Department of Investigations, when they were investigating me, attempted 17 different times in 18 months through numerous CIs, CIs being confidential informants, for me to bring in contraband. And I've declined all 17 times. Because they knew that I was doing it, they just didn't know to who. Uh So I'll backtrack. This inmate proposed to me, hey, listen, um, I got it. I know that you're not going to bring no drugs in here. That's fine. You want to do security on the outside? And in my head at that time, I'm 23 years old. I'm still living with my mother. Still living with my mother because that check, that $4,200 check is not that check yet. Not yet. 
Not yet. What What, what were you getting? <clears throat> what were you getting? Um, after taxes, not but I'm single male. Uh, sixteen, seventeen, fifty. That sound about right. After taxes, you know, and I'm hitting my. I'm in my second year at this right. time. It's about three three bands yeah, a month. That right. sound about right. right. And it's like in New York City. That's not going anywhere, right. especially now. You right. guys know especially that now. it's crazy now. But <laughs> even back then, that wasn't a lot, mm-hmm. you know. And my ego played a part with like, well, when I move out, I got to make sure my mom's is good too. Because obviously, this is kind of the point where I took this test so I could bounce. My goal is 25, I'm out the door. Uh, I'm going to these banks. I'm going to these uh, um, meetings that they're having about putting down the 3% for the crib and mm-hmm. you being a city employee, how the banks can help you and the credit union. So I'm hyping myself up to buy a house. That's my goal. So that kind of clicked. And I'm like, security. And in my head, I'm like, well, what type of security? He's like, yo, you just got to drive around. You don't got to touch nothing, nothing. And at that point when he says touch nothing, I kind of already know what he does in the street already. I'm just kind of fronting to myself that I want more information. Yeah, you playing dumb. So he rips out the piece of paper. He writes it on. He writes a number down. He says, yo, call this whenever you're ready. I throw it in my pocket. Nobody sees nothing. And I don't, I don't call that number for weeks. Weeks, weeks, weeks until I see him again. Because remember, I'm on the wheel. I'm doing the escort at this time, so I'm all over the building. Are you already in three main at that point? I just started with three main. And for pe- for 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 outside sources, three main was the box, the three bang in C seventy three in GMDC. That was the box. Yeah, for me, it was um the B side was the mental health box. So these are inmates that have committed violent acts, but they also have a mental health level that they cannot be in population. Right. For whatever reason, they take extremely hard psych meds that the doctor themselves has to physically be there and make sure they take it and, you know, double check that they're not hoarding it. Like, wasn't there two counselors that stayed in? Yes. The, uh, yeah, I remember that. Yes. I'm like, yo, there's always two, like two counselors in here. Yeah. And we'll get there. Yeah. Because <laughs> that housing area was different. And bananas. I kind of had control of it when I was there. As much as I could, you know, because this is a, 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 a psych ward in a sense. These inmates are flooding the tear. They're throwing water and soap all over the place. They're uh, lighting their mattresses on fire. They're banging. Cutting up. They're cutting up. They're banging on doors 24-7. Uh, they're refusing to eat. Uh, they're fighting each other just to get in the shower. When you uh, escort the inmate out the shower, you got to make sure that, you know, he's... He's not going to do anything to you because it's just you and him at that point because everybody else is locked in. So it was a hectic place. And then on top of that, on the A side, I had the Crips, which in our building, which was predominantly blood, that's the only uh, one of the only houses that they could live in. And they were sharing that space with the Patrias and Trinitarios, which are the basically the Dominican Mafia in jail. And they hate each other, but because they're both hated by the blood and the bloods are dominant in that building, that's the only place they could put them. They still have to go to the um, law library. They still have to have access to the barbershop. They still have to go to the clinic. And I was a person escorting them. So I had to deal with that tension, and then I had to deal with the tension of the mental health box. All of this, while I'm still doing extracurricular stuff, in the opposite sides of the buildings because I might drop an inmate off at the visit, but then I have someone here, so I'm all over the place. That gave me the accessibility to see this dude more often than usual. Mm -hmm. We'll fly uh, back to that same scenario when he gives me the number. Uh, I don't call. Um, He sees me again. He gives me like the... What's up? That night I called. It's his brother. He tells me it's his brother. He's like, yo, we've been waiting for you, this and that. Um, let's, Let's... Let's link up. Let's do something. Let's make shit shake. I go uptown. Uh, I'm a Queens dude, but my father was in Harlem a lot. My girlfriend at that time was in Harlem, so I was kind of back and forth. And I knew that na- going to that neighborhood wasn't like something I I would have never done. It was like I lived there basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, I drive him. He comes in a car. He doesn't have anything on him. He introduces himself. We start talking in Spanish. He's telling me, yo, he can't wait for his brother to come home, this and that. I'm I'm already, like, in a rush. I don't know what's about to happen. Right. Let's drive to uh, 34th Street. So we go to 34th Street and 10th Avenue. It's like an underground parking lot. Mm-hmm. Gets a ticket. He's in my car at this time. 
I'm driving. He's a passenger. He meets some dude there. He grabs a bag. I don't see anything else after that. They exchange what they exchange, and I take him back uptown. $2,500 cash. To you? 45 minutes. He said, you ain't got to touch nothing. Just drive. Nothing. So to see my bi-weekly and another week check in 40 minutes, turn me out. Right. Mm-hmm. Started doing the security thing two or three times a week. Sometimes it was twenty five hundred. Sometimes it was four thousand. I guess it all depend on the frequency as how much of a good week his organization had on the street. I got twelve thousand one time, and you're like, you didn't get twelve thousand. It's in my paperwork. So when you seeing those numbers and you're twenty three years old, and then you got to deal with blood, sweat, and tears, and only getting seventeen hundred by weekly. I don't know, man. I'm a, I'm a big believer that everyone has a price. Mm. It might not be, you know, uh, a price that it, it has to be crazy. It's like me telling you, um, you should bungee jump, and you're scared of heights. But if I gave you 65 million and I guaranteed you that I had this f- safety net, you're gonna do it. I'm doing it for 65 million. It doesn't matter about you. <laughs> That's don't, a lot of money. Fuck. That's a lot of fucking money, care. though. You don't care about. The, the outcome, right, 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 the right. Fe- the fear goes out the window because, right. you know, at that time, greed overrode everything. So, I got on when I was 24. I got about six months on the rock. And you and I obviously had our few exchanges, obviously, because we know each other. I was happy you landed in my building. Me too. Matter of fact, remember when I came on on the job training, when I was still in the academy, mm-hmm. I made it a point to text you. But we were like this. Right. I says, bro, I'm coming to C-73. Because I couldn't hold you down anywhere else. Right. <laughs> that, right. Was, that was all I knew was C-73. And I made it a point to come to you when I got there. Like, my nigga, like, what is it? Tell me the energy in this mm-hmm. building. Mm-hmm. And you like, bro, just be yourself. Yeah. Because I already know what you bring to the table. These guys could dissect the real mm-hmm. because they wholeheartedly give themselves that title. Right. So, you know, real recognize real. It's not cliche to say in there because word gets around. It's a popularity contest. Yeah. It's, it's like a high school energy. You got the cool guys. You got the guys that are broke. Uh, You know, like it's that type of energy. You got like... Uh, status with gang members and gang members are popular in there Mm -hmm. not even because of what they've done but whatever they've contributed makes them famous you know so with I want to say about three months of me being on a job they started putting me in three main and they started trying to incentivize three main Mm -hmm. nobody wanted to work three main it was the worst housing worst house in the building in the building, it was to the point where I would get a text message from staff. Yo, what do I do if 16 cell doesn't want to lock in and he still has to take his diabetic shot and he's over here telling me that uh, to call the warden and he's going to cut himself and it's my day off. Yeah. But do I look out for my fellow officer and put him on? It came to the point, man. And I know this sounds crazy, but it came to the point when the person that I was talking to, they were downstairs in the locker room texting me. And I was telling them what to do. Like, if this was, like, uh, like on a Zoom meeting. Like, I need you to do this, and we were sharing the screen. Right. You know, like, it's crazy. With, with respect to you already just establishing yourself and gaining that respect in the building, do you, do you believe that... Excuse me. Once you made the decision to start introducing yourself in the manner of other than just the law enforcement mm-hmm. aspect of it, do you believe that assists you with the level of respect that you started gaining in the building? Like, how did it work? Because I'm sure inmates talk. Inmates talk. Inmates talk. And the word is going, jail is small. It's big, but it's small. Inmates talk. And, and how did it get to the point where now everyone in the building started figuring out what you were doing? It's a glorifying thing to them. And it became that even post me becoming an inmate because to them, crime is is the sport. Right. So doing the wrong thing to them is doing the wrong thing for the right reason. 
You just holding your fellow brother down. I'm from Jamaica Ave too, bro. I'm dying in here. Yeah. I'm fucked up. So that little finger, and by finger I say like a surgical glove full of tobacco, I can make $250 off of that. I could save 50 and eat it here and send 200 to my baby mom because she's fucked up in the street without me. So that's their mentality. Mm-hmm. When I became an inmate within eight months, I'm getting, and I, I, I put it in quotes, but I'm getting fan mail from inmates that I housed. Yo, Dominguez, when you get up north, don't worry about it, bro. The bros got you. And I say the bros, whatever gang they were talking about. Um, my, my baby mom got a friend for you. She, she'll write you. She'll come visit you. Just let me know which one you want. Send me pictures. I got a $50 money order from an inmate. And it's like, damn, maybe I did change people's day and it was a negative way of doing it but i took them out of this element and that's what any vice does Mm -hmm. is take you out out that world because you want to escape and the fact is that nobody there can escape not even staff did you this shit is crazy did you at any point as it started getting i guess as, as you started to continue on with the process did you start to hear anything around the building that alarmed you about just overall what you were getting into? Because I'm going to keep it real with you. I want to say about six months into me being there, I had about six or seven people come up to me. Hey, yo, 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 Mo, pull up on me. What's up? What's good, bro? Yo, what's up with Steve? Like, that's your man? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, I grew up. That's my guy. Like, I met him when I was about 12 years old. Like, that's that's family. They like... Is that somebody you just know or, like, that's really your man? I'm like, what I just said? Like, that's right. that's my man. Yeah, I've, right. I, I've known him since I was a child. Yeah, because they're, they're, they're seeing what level of loyalty there is before they, before they say something. Opinion. Right, and I'm like, nah, that like that's my man. What yeah. we talking about? And they're like, I, yo, I just want to, like, kind of put you on. Like, mm-hmm. yo, it, he hot. Yeah. I'm like... It got there. It got and there. that's why I made sure, that's why I asked you that question. Like, were you hearing anything around the building? It got there. And then when there was a drought, which uh, I kind of write about in the book because I, I make myself a fictitious character, of course, but I still give elements of what I went through and what I saw in my point of view. Um, it got to a point where it stopped for like four months. I didn't do anything because the dude's brother and his organization, whatever happened with... Anything that they were dealing with, something was going off. And I didn't get no phone calls to do anything. So I kind of felt a little sense of relief. Because mm. at that point, even then, I made a decent amount of money. So I was okay. Like, my savings was looking way more different. And then if I stop now, I'll never get caught because I'm not doing it again. Mm-hmm. So when that happened, it was like a sense of relief. But then... What happens, the money starts to dry a little and, you know, you have to keep up with a certain lifestyle. Uh, I'm taking Jeeps off the lot. I'm buying Grand Cherokees like they're fucking uh, Hot Wheels. I remember when you bought the first one. <laughs> I had two. I remember that shit. <laughs> um, and that was part of the, the, the being the only responsibility was myself. So all that money, aside from me throwing bread to my mom's and making sure that she's going to Costco every two weeks, giving her money to go on a cruise, making sure the house that uh, she has in Columbia, everything is set right. It's like, I still got money left. Right. I don't have no kids. And that's when Grant, and listen, everybody's not from New York. At one point, Grand Cherokees was... Oh yeah, yeah. Going crazy yeah, in New York. Yeah, that was yeah. just a popular vehicle. I don't want you yeah. know motherfuckers would be like, this nigga yeah, just had a, jam, a grand G- Cherokee? G- like, nah, that G- was G- that was a thing in New York for a Listen, period of time. So in, in twenty fourteen, <laughs> when they changed that body and and the inside had that Mercedes Benz lining, if you had the official one, not the base one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking about panoramic roof and all that stuff. Like, I'm twenty three, y'all. Right. I keep forgetting the age. I'm twenty three and I'm pulling these out and I have a charger and I have an M six and it's like I'm running out of things to do with my money that I'm like, damn, you know what, man? Let me let me let me be smart about this. Mm-hmm. But then that drought happened and I'm like, all right, maybe it was meant to be. Whatever fun I had, maybe I didn't meet the goal of being a homeowner or getting out of my mom's crib, even though I did towards the end of it. It's like there was a little bit of like I kind of missed that. Yeah. So 
I think I work overtime one day and I get that same question again from a female officer. Mm. Yo, Mo, you and D good? Like you and Dominguez, that's your people? <laughs> I'm like, yo, what the it's fuck? always that. Yeah, yeah. and then I just, always, it just started getting. To, I'm like, yo, what the fuck that. is going on? Like, why people keep asking me that? So you know, me naturally now, like my my, my spotty senses is going off now because I'm like, yo, something got to be wrong for everyone to keep yeah. asking me that. I think you were probably. I'm not gonna tell you what you were feeling or thinking, but you were probably trying to like put together how to even approach me. I think honestly, it was me just. Or even wanting to approach you. Nah, I was gonna, I had, no, I mean, I know you, so yeah. I was, it's like, I, I, now my my biggest thing was, I want to ask him, why is everyone asking me that? Because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm obviously in the dark about something, so I made it a point when I saw you, I'm like, yo, this was a Sunday when I saw you. It was a Sunday afternoon when I went after that conversation with Shorty, so I did overtime Saturday night, I saw you Sunday around about two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, I worked the one to nine. Right, in the corridor. And I'm just like, yo, bro, like, we got to chop it up. Yeah. And you kind of, like, gave me one of these, like, what's up? Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, nah, we, I don't want to talk here. Because knowing you, that I, that tone of voice seemed too serious. Because we usually, the, the the good thing about being cool with certain officers is that you're always going to try to joke around and bring some light right. when you're not in the housing area. Because, unfortunately, you have to have a certain demeanor. You have to be tough. You have to look tough. You have to be on point and on guard when you're in the house. For sure. Because at any given moment, there could be a chair flying across your head. Some uh, inmate could try to catch another inmate while you're talking to him. Like, it can get... So when you see fellow staff in uh, the staff kitchen eating or they have a smoke break outside or in the corridor, it's usually about something bright and happy or what we're doing tonight Mm -hmm. or this club was popping. It's something bright because... The, the energy in the housing area is so, like... It's just tense. It's, it's just the tension. air is thick. You could walk in the housing area and know that somebody's about to get Something about to happen. Or something is about to happen. Motherfuckers is, is sitting there, edge of the bed, sneakers on. Yeah. And it's just like, yo, what, what's going on in here? Like, well, y'all good? Yeah. What fucked me up is that I could de-escalate those things because of what I was doing. Right. So... I say, I, I going back. I, I, you know, I'm like, yo, I, we got. I just don't want to talk here. Like, I just, it's just, I need, I, we need to talk. You said, bet. I get off at nine o'clock. I'm gonna come pull up. I'm gonna come to the crib and we gonna chop it up. At nine o'clock, I was, you know, mm-hmm. I swear to God, bro. And to this day, you can ask my lady. I'm just like, yo, I'm waiting for Steve. And you ain't show up. I'm like, this nigga probably tired. Like, he, he want to go home. Cool. I'll get with him tomorrow. He working work three minutes. Yeah, like, right. Like, his, he's drained. I'm like, yo, I'll get with him tomorrow. And then Monday afternoon, I'm off. Not at work. And I got 17 missed calls. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck is going on? And I answered that call. And I call, I'm not going to say the officer's name, but him and I get on the phone and he's like, bro, did you hear what the fuck happened to Steve? I'm like, nah, what's going on? He said, bro, the whole building right now is on fire. They searching every crib in here. That was not too long ago. That was the day after Father's Day. Yeah, That's bro. Month, oh, 2014. I saw you that Sunday, bro. You got, they they they, they ran down on you on Monday. Mm-hmm. The next day. Mm-hmm. Monday morning. Was it a Target parking lot? It was a Target parking lot. Mm-hmm. I had went to go do a drop off. Um, we were meeting uh, in Manhattan. This was at like eight in the morning. I was still hungover from the barbecue that I was at. Mm-hmm. That's probably why I didn't link up with you because mm-hmm. I forgot that I had the barbecue um, that I was invited to for Father's Day. It's like eight in the morning. I still have a hangover. Uh, we'll get later on into who I meet, but now I'm not meeting this dude's brother. I'm mm-hmm. actually meeting the Colombian dude that's giving him the work because he's heard so much about me and my consistency that because I have the badge and the gun, they're more comfortable with moving as much work as possible because if I get pulled over, we're good. Mm-hmm. You know, That's what I'm being paid for. I'm not over here. I, I, I want people to remember and understand I wasn't really selling drugs. Mm-hmm. I wasn't bagging up cocaine. I wasn't weighing anything. I wasn't doing nothing. Right, you were like, you were the... the Chauffeur. I'm just a chauffeur. Right. You know? So But you got the credentials. Right. You got the badge. That's what I'm And that's the most for. important thing. You and, got the credentials. And to them, they that's priceless because they can't get it. Because right. if they could get it, I wouldn't be here. You know? So I had something that they couldn't have. 
It's a and, movie. And it's, it's power. <laughs> it's a whole movie right now. Yeah, my I, I wrote the screenplay. Yeah. I wrote the screenplay. We'll get into that. Um, What were we talking about? The process of now... It all it all unfolds. They get you on that target. Right. So, you, you, yeah, met, so you met I, Colombian. I, I met the Colombian, yeah, I met the Colombian yeah. dude. This is the third time I'm I'm uh, dealing with the Colombian dude, and he's telling me we're gonna go to Yonkers. I'm with my co-defendant at the time. My co-defendant is a correction officer that I just met, but I put on to do this because all the inmates have told me that he's bringing in drugs to the jail, but he doesn't know what he's. They doing. told you that about him. They told me. Just like you wanted to pull me to the side. They're like, yo, more than six different inmates in different housing areas. Ironically, after the last person told me, I said, nah, I got I to gotta approach this dude. And I don't know him from a hole in the wall. He just started. He just started. He doesn't have a uh, push in two years. But I see him in intake. And I'm like, yo, let me let me talk to you real quick. Um, He goes, what's up? And... I remember my grandmother telling my mother this and my mother telling me this, and it's a saying in Latin culture, if you're going to do something wrong, make sure that you do it right. Mm-hmm. And when I told him that, he's he already knew what I was talking about. So he's looking at me like, how the fuck do you know? He doesn't know what I do. He's too new to know what I do. The building in general, inmates and staff, it's just tall tales at this point. Mm-hmm. But I'm so... And, and I hate to sound this arrogant when it comes to uh, negative behavior, but I was so good at doing what I was doing that it was just, I think he is. But the I think he is was because the inmates are listening to me. Mm-hmm. And I only been there for three years. And you have officers that are teeny that have been there 25, and the inmate still tells them to suck their dick. Mm-hmm. I'm not going nowhere. So the fact that this semi-rookie, not even top-tier officer, is holding down C-73, five main, three main, one main. I'm preventing riots in there, bro. I'm preventing the three main guys from really going crazy. So Yo, when I tell you that's where, three that, main, that's where it came out. I don't know about, listen, I, and I'm speaking from the aspect of when I was brand new. That's some shit that I don't think the on for the mental aspect that people need to understand, like, my first day in three men, I had homie in cell two cut himself up. Homie in cell one set the cell on fire. Uh, other homie down the tear wrapped the uh, wrapped the uh, phone cord around his uh, arm when the slot opened. Said, "I'm sticking it up. I'm not giving the phone back up." Uh, I had I had Hill Hill and cell Hill, Hill cell and I, that's how you know it's real because I remember homie's name cell thirteen Hill. I get in there. He had the cell right next to the shower. Yeah, I get in there and he goes. Hey, yo, D, pull up. Mind you, he don't know me. It's my first. He said, we have no rapport because it's my first time working in there. Yo, D, pull up. I go to the cell. What's going on, homie? He's like, yo, I'm number one in that shower today. I, I don't even, I, don't, I had no idea how three main works. I've never, I, this was my first day. He's thinking first come, first serve. Right. I'm like, all right. So I, other homie, in the, I, feel, I don't know what cell. He, he hears me. Nah, D, not happening. I'm number one in that shower. My name number one on that list. Go look at the shower list. I don't know a shower list exists, but when he says that, I'm like, okay, let me go look at the shower list. Before I can walk off, Hill goes, yo, D, you not hearing me. Look at me. I'm number one on that shower list. And he's talking you through a slot. He's talk. He's in the cell. He's talking to me through. I'm looking in the plexiglass, though. That you could barely even look, see through because there's so much in, engraved graffiti. Right. There's feces. So I just see, like, his head a bit. And he's like, you not hearing me. I'm number one in that on that list. Then it start, it start kicking. I'm like, oh, son trying to put pressure on me. So I'm like, yo, let me go pull up to the shower list and see what's up. I step off. I forg- You you weren't at work this day. I don't, I, th- I don't remember who was in there with me, but they always had about four or five of us in there. <laughs> <laughs> and when one I, housing when, area. When I wasn't there, bro. <laughs> so I go to them and I'm like, yo, how this whole shower situation work? So he's like, go look at the shower list. Whoever's one on the list, they go first. I said, so why is homie in, in, in cell 13 telling me to put him in first? He said, cell 13, cell 13. He's like, oh, that's hell. I'm like, talk to me, bro. This is my first day in here. He like, nah, put Hill in there first. 
Yo, listen, that dude <laughs> told me one day now that I remember, because I was a steady, we had a certain rapport. And mind you, I'm not bringing none of these guys nothing. They just understand what's going on. And it's like I'm also assisting them because this is my house. So before going to the housing area, I go to the mail room because of all the shit that they're doing, uh, the officers are burning them. Burning them means they're not getting the extracurricular stuff because they're going crazy, right? Um, so I would go upstairs to the mail room and get their mail, their backed up mail, to a guy that's in that cell 23 hours a day in a mental health dorm and all that chaos is going on. It's kids on Christmas when they get a piece of mail. That's facts. So I might not have mail for everybody, but the fact that I brought a few pieces of what I saw was available and handed it out, they see like, nah, D, D is really caring for us. Like, there was one time the uh, they cut this dude in the day room. They were allowed to go to the day room uh, if they gained their, their time through seeing the psych and doing their program, whatever. That didn't go well. They pushed the uh, food. They pushed uh, chow like six hours back. It's 10 p.m. These dudes haven't ate yet. I went and I got milk, I got cereal, everybody got 15 boxes of milk, 10 crates of cereal, whatever they wanted. And an officer would say, I'm an inmate lover for that. But now I'm just reducing tension. I got to work here. Mm -hmm. right. And then y'all calling me on my days off because y'all can't handle it. So why can't I give them fucking cereal? Because after a while, when inmates get on your nerves and they make your day hectic, you're going to say, fuck them inmates. Yeah. It's easier just to have you locked in that cell and I ain't got to bother with you. And in their box, you ain't there for 23 hours anyway. How is it for uh, women? Uh, There's only one female officer. jail on... Oh, women, all, female officers. Like, like in there. They didn't go in there. It, it was... It, for that housing... Because I've heard, I've heard like... For that housing like, area... Like sexual wasn't stories, stories No, but like that. that housing area wasn't for happening that. because these inmates maybe can't physically do nothing. Because they'll have the males obviously escort them to the showers and everything. And they had me as an escort officer for visits in the clinic. But if there was a female, she would be in the bubble. And the only reason mm -hmm. she would be in the bubble away from the inmates is because these inmates didn't give a fuck. And they would back down on them, show them, you know, their genitals and uh, say certain things. And it's like, what are you going to do? Write them a ticket? If you check next to... Uh, their slot door, mm -hmm. it has their information, which is like their pedigree information. First, last name, booking case number, main charge. And they did that on purpose so you could see who you're talking to. Right. And how many days they had on the box. Some guys had two commas. Yeah. Shit. 11,000 days. It's like, what is a ticket for me it don't even showing matter my no more. going to do with, I have 11,000 days in the box. Not coming right. out the box anyway. I am going to shout out one person, Captain Combs. She was the only female that I saw going there yeah. who was never scared. And she, again, she's a captain, so she did, she wasn't working in that area. But when she came inside, man, Captain Combs, if she ever sees this interview, shout out to her because she was the only one who came in there and it was always so we solid. We definitely had great communication, and I think that's what helped. And again, they would take it serious when I wasn't there. Yeah, because, she was solid. You know, they have to really go into overtime, you know? Right, right. Uh, I, want, I want to give Hill one last uh Hill was bananas. Minute. I did put him in that shower too. For <laughs> <laughs> like, listen, my, it was my first day in there. I'm like, nah, I'm not jacking nothing today. Like, if... If, I that, came if, in, if that's the case, I'm putting him in that, in, that, in that shower first. I came in one day, and it was chaos. I don't know what was going on, but everything was going on. And then... I see Hill going out to the shower. And I'm like, yo, you can't bring him out to the shower. Like, we got to get everybody situated. And he goes, D, I'm going to the shower for everybody else's safety. Mm -hmm. And then when he gets in the shower, there's a slot in the shower. He goes, I could, he says something like, I, I can dissect these dudes with, like, just looking them in the eye. I can see that they're not tigers, and I'm the only tiger in here. They do everything that I say. The only reason I follow the rules with you is because you haven't done anything wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Nah, Hill was bananas. He, uh, and I'm a, and I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> remember homie from Belly, Black, mm -hmm. who told DMX, show you go get yours, B. He you was, go get yours. He was working in that box. He was, he worked in the box. He was an inmate in the, in the three building, but his job, like he, he worked in the box. He would hand out food and shit. Yeah. Hill. 
threw shit on him. He called him over to the slot one day. He said, yo, Black, come here. And Black, thinking everything is sweet, he looks through the slot. He said, yo, take this thing real quick. And he goes, what? He had a, a, a lunch box, one of the school lunch boxes full of feces and urine. And he throws it on Hill. And it goes directly. Throw it on Black. On Black. It goes directly to every part of his face. Mm. Like shit like that Like hitting this thing. And it was for nothing There was no beef It's just hell just But being, you're dealing just being You're dealing an with uh, Someone who maybe Medication is not on Or didn't take their meds And they're locked in For 23 hours a day Right They're going crazy No radio Right No TV So So what what happened So the Colombian You, you met up with the Colombian I met up with the Colombian dude Um He's telling us to go to Yonkers. He gives me and my co-defendant, the other officer at that time, that I put on because I wanted him to stop bringing in drugs to the facility because he's making it hot for me too. So, so, so that particular part, because you did mention, you said um, um, that you had walked up to him. Hold I, up, camera yeah, shut. Yeah, got it. Go ahead, you keep, keep, yeah, we gonna keep going. Um, so he, you need him to stop because he about to fuck your shit up. He's making it hot. And I'm right. telling him, if you're going to do something wrong, make sure you do it right. So I'm trying to tell him, like, yo, I'm doing the security thing. And they asked me mm-hmm. if I had somebody else. Mm-hmm. But I don't want nobody else knowing what I'm doing. It's not that I'm ashamed of it. I just nobody's business. And I know that it's so sacred of a thing to do that I wouldn't want nobody to even tell somebody else. Mm-hmm. So he looks at me and he realizes he knows that I know. And he basically gives me the sob story. Like, yo, listen, man, uh, I'm a little backed up on bread. And this bread ain't what it's doing. And that's why I'm bringing in tobacco. He was only bringing in tobacco. But the way he was doing it was just, you know. Sloppy. It was just sloppy. You know, I'm not here to say that was a Michael Jordan or that shit. It was Right, just, right, right. He was going to make it hot. So I put him on to game and he was my co-defendant. I didn't really know him too well. I got to know him through doing through these that. runs. He did two two runs with me or three one, three runs. And he made like 12 grand. Mm. That was a lot of money to him mm-hmm. You know So I say that to say uh, I try to look out for this dude Even though I didn't know him And I think I had that issue Because If you really want to get into The psychological aspect of this I was kind of helping These guys too Because I'm relieving Whatever pain they were going through And they're making money And so am I And they're making my transition Into this correction officer For New York City in Rikers Island, the most dangerous, most infamous jail in the U.S., and I never had a fist fight yet. Mm-hmm. I never had an issue with an inmate. Right. I never had a use of force. That's so weird. Right. Why have you not physically gotten into an altercation? I'm not a small guy. I was even bigger back then. Yeah. So yeah. They it it's it's not it, it's, it doesn't work for them. They don't know why, and I think that's what started the questions. Like he has to be doing something, and they were right mm. because they'd never seen that much control over these guys. So now you this all this shit unfolds. Obviously, hits the paper. The media is going crazy over it. Yeah, they, they the headlines were ridiculous, bananas. Man, they were saying I was bringing in kilos of cocaine to Rikers Island. I got caught on the Rikers Island Bridge. The headlines got, were crazy. I got arrested in the Bronx. I got arrested in Queens. I got arrested in Manhattan. Yeah, uh, I was in Colombia a few months prior to that. I'm half Colombian, um, but they made it seem like I, I went to Colombia twice that year, and it was to re up bricks because i have a connect out there they made it seem like i was i, I know shock of the shock i know but the reason why they doing this think of the time is 2014 instagram's really starting to flourish where dudes are showing what they have right that's the thing it's not about taking family pictures or vacation pictures or wifey pictures at dinner now i'm showing you i have the cars i have the jewelry right uh the strip clubs are popping at this time BBL culture, Starlets, Perfections, the top tier strip clubs of the world are in New York. Mm-hmm. So they see that I'm in this type of lifestyle, but I'm just a city employee. So that also sparked a conversation. Mm-hmm. And then they watching my Instagram. I'm, I'm around celebrities. I'm around people that know people. Right. So it looks crazy. I look like a rapper. Right. So now, boom, all unfolds. And here you are now. On the opposite side of it, on the other side of the fence, you went from being the CO 
to now you're an inmate. An inmate. And what was that process like when now you recognize and realize, one, the whole CO thing is over with, and now... I thought I was dreaming. Going back to that Target parking lot, when the feds came in, they, they uh, I was walking with the duffel bag in hand alongside my partner. He's going to his designated vehicle. I'm going to mine. We were supposed to go to two different locations. Uh, I had like two and a half kilos in the, in the um, duffel bag. He had like only five ounces. And that was done on purpose because we were told to take certain bags were designated for me and him. And that was done on purpose because they know through wiretaps and their investigation I put him on, you know. Um, I checked my my Nike fuel band at the time to see what time it is. I'm like, oh, I'll get to Yonkers in like half an hour. And in slow motion... I see this white van and it's a Hertz rental van. The doors bust open on the side. And these guys have DEA vest on, AK-47, beams on it, everything. Get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground. And I have the duffel bag in my hand and I look at my partner and he's also giving me the same look like, should should we wake up right now? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not feeling this dream. That's what it feels like to me. And I swear to you, everything was in slow motion to the point where I heard this guy say, get on the ground like a hundred times. I finally go to put my knee on the ground. I drop the duffel bag. I get somebody on top of me. As soon as I touch the ground, they take my personal firearm that I had on me. They take the clip out, the one in the holster, uh, the one in the head. He gives it to his partner. I'm surrounded by federal agents and I'm looking at my partner going through the same thing. And the Colombian guy is fighting, fist fighting with the feds. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck is going on? It's 8 in the morning on a Monday. So there's no cause aside from the unmarked vehicles that they came up in. And then when I get up off my knees and I'm in handcuffs, it's like 300 officers. I, I thought there was a helicopter at one point. There wasn't. But I'm like, oh, this is real. So, yeah, this, like, is, this is real. It's all out. I get in the car. It's a small Asian uh, DA agent female. There's nobody in the passenger. And this this big white boy comes in the back and sits. Big vest with the uh, badge out. And I ask a stupid question. But I'm like, yo, what precinct are we going to? Because I'm trying to keep composure. I'm still thinking I'm dreaming. And he goes, precinct? And he shows me his badge. He goes, we're going to headquarters. I said, oh, shit. And I'm on the West Side Highway which is one of the last times I actually got to see New York City for a very long time. Mm. And we get to headquarters, and it really snowballs from there. Because mm. that's why I saw how real, real... Like, real. this shit is really about to happen to me. How much time did you do? In total, five years, nine months, and 27 days. I was sentenced to eight years for A1 criminal possession, A1 criminal sale, Conspiracy 2, Conspiracy 4 and 5, promoting prison contraband, promoting prison contraband and bribery receiving. And you did you did that time in what Clinton Max the whole yeah. that whole time you did in Clinton? Um I was in that well I was fighting my case because my bail was $750,000 bond and $500,000 cash. Mm. And you would ask why is that bail so high for a non violent drug possession because the feds were the ones funding me the money that I was getting from this drug dealer. Mm -hmm. They were allowing him to sell drugs. So it was a setup. He was selling drugs. This wasn't fake for 18 months. This was fake the last day. This wasn't fake for 18 months. So he's been a confidential informant for a very long time. Who was the drug dealer the, the inmate. The inmate. The inmate, oh, too. The uh, the inmate, too, but the Colombian guy as well. But the Colombian guy is actual a uh, federal agent. Yeah, this, all this shit was a setup. So what, what, So that started as soon as they started talking in, in the prison. Basically, so the, the introduction was between the inmate and I only. After me doing these runs and him seeing that his time is not going anywhere and the DA is not trying to bud because he's facing 15 to life. He snitched. He said, hey, listen. But he didn't snitch because he's been snitching for a long time. He's been a CI for a long time. That's why in the jail, he gets to do whatever he wants. Because the feds, all all they have to do is call the warden and say, hey, listen, uh, inmate such and such, he's with us. 
So now they can't, he's like untouchable in a way. And it goes to show in hindsight because he had Jordans in there. He had a chain. Again, strippers coming to see him. He was the man. And he made it known because I dealt with him a few times. And obviously I'm in the dark about what's going on. I, I, I And I was always trying to figure out. Why is this but the like, fact, sorry, the fact that he knows what inmate this is out of 7,000 inmates, he has to stand out. Like he made it a point to, and he, I dorm. He was li- he was living in dorm twelve, mm-hmm. and I worked that crib a couple times. And I don't know what happened this particular day, but he was just kind of talking out his mouth. And I'm like, "Yo, what's what's good with you today? Like, chill out." And he said some shit to me, and I, you know, me just being regular, I'm I'm still I'm still tapped in in regular mode. I know I'm a CEO, and I have to you know move a certain way. But I'm like, "Yo, bro, like we could get it. Like, what's up with you?" Right. And he was like, "We could get it." He was like, "You know who I am." He's like, you better ask Duffy about me. Duffy was our warden. Mm-hmm. I said, what you, what you say? He said, you better ask Duffy about me. You want to laugh? What? Uh, 60 days before I got knocked, I got a certificate of appreciation from Warden Duffy for working in Three Main because uh, one of the officers that was doing a meal relief there, he went to uh, uncuff an inmate through the slot. The inmate reached back and took his radio. And now he has his radio. I remember that shit too. He has his radio in the cell and he's on the radio. Going bananas on the radio. He's screaming now. He's starting, he's starting to rap. He's shouting out his boys. And the whole building can hear it because all officers carry a radio for safety reasons. Everybody has a radio for the most part, at least in the bubble, you know? Or or they have access to a phone. So he has a full blown radio with brand new battery. He's talking for six hours straight. They're trying to get the radio back. They're trying to get the radio back. And they call me, and he's still not giving the radio back. And I'm trying, and I'm trying, and I'm trying. It goes into the next day. I go home, and I come back, and I relieve the officer, and he still has that radio. When we got to roll call that morning, whatever that guy's last name was, John Doe, John Doe has a radio still. And then you hear him. So now they said everybody in the building switched to Channel 2. In case there's an alarm, he won't know we're on Channel 2. He's not stupid. He's checking every channel to see what we're talking on. And he's disrupting the day, and it's crazy. And I finally get the radio <laughs> back. Yeah, but the shit was bananas. I finally get the radio back. Yeah, that's And crazy. I got a certificate of appreciation two months before I got knocked. So I wasn't a bad officer. I just did bad things, but I wasn't a bad officer. You know how many suicides I prevented in there? You know how many riots against gang members I prevented in there? So, so when you went through the process of being um, the court process, like, and the sentencing, like how was how was that process? That was that was very emotionally. You good? Yeah. Not because I hear a. That was me touching okay. the mic. Um, that was very emotionally draining, for my my mother, for my friends, family. But it was just, it was a real culture shock, because I've been I went from doing the count to being on the count. Mm. Right. How old were you? I was twenty five. I had just turned 25. My birthday is May 30th. I got locked up June 23rd. So I, I've been 25 for three weeks. Damn, so you got out <laughs> You got out 31? Yeah, 31. 31. Shit, it's bananas, bro. Um, what I want to say to you is, yo, I 100% commend you, and I, I really applaud you for being able to, one, fess and own up to the shit that you did, yeah, you know, man. people try to make excuses, and you're you're just like, listen, I fucked up. I did what I did. Greed. It was just, it was plain old greed. There's no other way. I can't tell you that. Oh, listen, I did this because times were nah. Times weren't that bad. I was just wanted a little more money, man. Yeah. It was like money be the root to all. And I took advantage of my power, and I sold my integrity. And this sounds very ar- arrogant, but. I did a lot of things at that age that I thought were cool that guys my age would dream about doing. Yeah. Traveling, the strip clubs, the partying, the popping the bottles, the driving exotic vehicles, the eating lavish restaurants, uh, going, you know, anywhere and doing anything I wanted freely because I had the funds to do so. Yeah. You know, so that was a high on itself because the only vice that CEOs have is alcohol. Mm Mm-hmm. Couldn't smoke weed. So maybe to get out of that world, I was kind of like compensating it with 
fuck that. I'm gonna do it shit my way. You know. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, man, look, I um, we gotta definitely do like <laughs> yeah, we could talk. There's gonna be a part two. Yeah, it has to be like cause we could do this yeah. shit all day. It has to be. Um, fact of the matter is, like I said, you did your time. Mm-hmm. You own your shit. You're out now. Who I I can care less about what took place when this all transpired. I care about the fact that you are, in my opinion, and in my life, a stand up guy. You uh, I've always watched you and your mom. You know, I used to come to your crib. You feel yeah. me when you lived in the building right there off yeah. Springfield, yeah. and you know just the rapport that you had with your mother and how you just always wanted to make sure you assisted with your family. Yeah, yeah. and I became the the man of the house very early. Absolutely, man. So that stems from. Years before Absolutely. This. And I want to make sure that I tell you I'm extremely proud of you, man. I I'm I'm cha- I'm in I'm four chapters in the book. I'm not finished yet, but I, I I'm liking what I'm reading. It's I, a good book. It is, man. bro. It's I not, I'm really not, happy for I you. I want to tell the audience it's not just my story. I know my story sounds compelling, but I'm a grain of salt when it comes to what really goes down. And it's not me exposing secrets. This has been going on before me and you were alive. Before Absolutely. Any, any of us here were It's probably alive. still going on. And it's, who, go, and it's even knows, worse probably. now. It's even worse now. Maybe off camera, I want to show you guys a picture of an assault that just happened. Mm. And these are little kids, like, going to war, man. Like, aside from what they're doing in the street, shooting at each other, playing, you know, laser tag for real, in the jails, it's it's deeper because there's nowhere to go. Right. There's nowhere to go, and these kids are killing each other, man. And they 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 find ways that if they used those resources and how intelligent they could be when they go to, you know, make a weapon and strategically, you know, jump someone, they could be good businessmen. They could be great employees at a, a Fortune 500 company, but they don't have a lot of resources. Right. right. There's four channels on the TV in a day room when there's – where, where there's 31 to 50 guys and there's three phones and they go to wreck at 5.30 in the morning for one hour. Where, what else am I what doing do you expect, time? What yeah. do you expect them to do? Right, right. I can only talk about the Knicks and me being in a strip club that night because they want to be entertained for so long. Right. So, you know. I, I listen. I absolutely promise you guys, we we will do a part two. I swear to God. Um, we like yeah, I said, we so much there's about. so much to talk about, and I mean, we could sit here. I mean, we could do this all fucking day. Um, again, I want to thank you, man, for really coming here and sitting down on this platform and giving your truth. Nah, thank um, you, man, for sure, man. I really appreciate I'm proud this. Of you with this because I appreciate um, you on, on some New York City slang, and this is slang. Don't take this out of context. What you're doing is is kind of gangster because you're kind of f- fighting against a machine, yeah. you know. And it's like you're still holding your uh, principles and what you, I guess, live by, mm-hmm. and you're not letting them take that away from you. Not at all. And it, I'll never let my code of ethics get buried. So as long as I'm here, I'm gonna make sure I live and die by my code of ethics. And whoever can appreciate it, you know, cool. Whoever can't appreciate it. You know, God bless you too. Right. So with For that, sure. you know what I'm saying. And, and, and even before we get off, though, uh, mention your book and Please. also where they can. Are you on social media? Yes, I'm on social media. My IG handle is Chill Stevie C H I L L S T E V I E. Um, across the bridge can be also uh, purchased on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Google Play. I was number 43 on Apple Books when it came out. Mm. I was number six on Amazon. Uh, the audio book is out if you don't want to read. It's a great thing to listen to if you're cleaning the crib, if you're driving to work. Like, I did the the voiceover. Mm-hmm. I could have paid somebody in Idaho to do the voiceover, but it wasn't going to be that grittiness. It wasn't going to have that content that I wanted. I even do the female voices. I mm. try to do the female dope, voices. Dope. So the money that I made from the book, I put into getting into the studio because I figured not too many people have time to read Let's be honest, not too many people do read. Mm-hmm. How, how much is the book? The book on Amazon fluctuates, but it's between $17 and $23. Okay. Because they have yeah. sales. Right. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good price. The, the ebook is $9.99 and the audio is $9.99. Bet. Yeah. Uh, before I let y'all off on the book, I'm doing a social experiment that I'm interviewing people. That's something that I'm filming. I'm in the works of filming with these shirts right here. 
if you think that my story across the bridge and what we spoke about today is wild, I'm sitting with people that went and visited Rikers and they're telling you their perspective. I speak to a teacher that went to go visit one of his students that was there. I speak to somebody that with the city councilman and someone, uh, one of the councilmen from Queens, they were able to install a music studio in the adolescent building so the kids could learn how to engineer and all these things, like learn the production aspect of music, right. you know? So I'm getting everybody's story that's not just the violence. There's other things that happen on Rikers Island. We're trying to get Cormega. He uh, performed with Big Pun in 1997 on Rikers Island. We're trying to get stories that, like, everyone has touched base here. Right. Whether they been themselves, they know somebody that works there, or visited somebody accused of doing a crime, Rikers Island is not far-fetched to people that live in New York City. So right. I'm trying to get those stories out. I have an EMT that used to go and pick up inmates and take them to Elmhurst. Right. Like, I, I want y'all to hear those stories. So, so that's coming to play. Whatever platform, whatever whichever way you like to stimulate your mind and, and, and get informed, he has everything for you in, 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 in every aspect that you wanted. Yeah. So tap in, please um, follow us. Like we always say before we end off, follow us on all platforms. We're not going anywhere, and I say that all the time. Truth.